What's up meta nerds, today we're going to be taking a look at a criminally underexplored vehicle within both Star Wars Legends and Canon, the Republic's UT-80. We'll go over what little history we have, the specifications of this strange tank, and take a look behind the scenes to see what kind of details may be hidden in the archives. Let's crack open our holocrons and explore the reason this vehicle came to be. The Unstable Terrain Artillery Transport, also called the Trident, was a vehicle born of necessity. It was a collaboration between two companies that allowed this vehicle to glide into the battlefront in the midst of the Clone Wars. Our old friends at the famous Kuat Drive Yards decided to work in tandem with the engineers of the also obscure High Altitude Entry Transport 221, the fine engineers over at Mikun Corporations. Mikun was known more so for its work with repulsor technology, and with Kuat coming to the realization that its all-terrain line of combat vehicles wasn't quite living up to its name, it was time to work in a new design. One that would incorporate many of the classic Kuat features, but also integrate a series of repulsor lift skis to enable this thing to safely cross precarious terrain, like the bridges of Megiddo and Agamar. It was the disastrous Battle of Agamar, in fact, that allowed the UTAT to get up and running. As the Republic launched its attack on the world, known as the Mirgoshir Campaign, they found that the usually dependable ATTE was a poor choice given this world was abundant with natural land bridges. These heavy, plodding walkers stomped onto these paths with such force that it often led these bridges to give way and collapse under the weight resulting in a devastating loss of both equipment and, more crucially, the clones' lives. A Pyrrhic victory if there ever was one. And so with a lesson learned, the UTAT hovered off that assembly line and was pressed into combat. Mainly seeing its action towards the end of the Clone Wars, the UTAT was heavily used during Kaidi Mundi's Siege of Megiddo, a key Separatist world in the Outer Rim. We can see several of these craft being used to go gun to gun with the massive Octoptara, with the droid armies bombarding the front line. While we do see one damaged by a well-placed rocket, similar to the Hailfire downing the ATTE at the very beginning of the war on Geonosis, it's safe to assume these floating battle barges were getting results, as we do see Mundi and Bakara pushing forward against the droid army. We also know that these highly specialized death sleds were being put to work on the bridge-heavy world of Kato Nymordia, perhaps being led by Plo's bros in the Wolfpack before Order 66 went down. Aside from the wreckage of this vehicle being seen on scrap worlds after the rise of the Empire, that is all of the history the UTAT has written so far, as we barely see it in either canon or legends, despite it supposedly being introduced in 22 BBY. That either goes to show just how incredibly specific the circumstances needed to be for the Trident to be seen in battle, or out of universe, the producers of the Clone Wars didn't see much need to incorporate such an obscure vehicle into the Republic's army. Like the ATAP, it's another shame. So since that's it for a short history, let's break down the specs of this thing. It actually has quite a bit of interesting features, unique to its role within the Grand Army. With a length of 23.8 meters, or just a bit over 78 feet, the UTAT was actually longer than its cousin, the ATTE, and about 13 Minox long. And if it came floating into combat on our Earth battlefields, it would be comparable to the size of 2.5 M1 Abrams tanks. We don't actually have a height measurement, shockingly, but just from what we see in the movies and from pictures, it's safe to say that it was around an ATTE, not including the legs, and so much taller than the Senate. Maintaining the mystery of this strange behemoth is its cost, as we also never do find out how many credits this baby would cost the Republic. What we do have is its speed. Clocking in at 45 kilometers per hour, or just under 28 miles per hour, it's safe to say that the UTAT wasn't blazing into battle. But that, however, wasn't its purpose, as you'll see when we look at these prongs that gave the Trident its name. These being the three massive forward-facing cannons. The main cannon of the UTAT was an artillery turbo laser, perfect for taking on massive droid walkers or thinning out swarms of CIS infantry. Flanking this great gun are two medium laser cannons, and while they may not look as deadly as the main turret, they certainly shouldn't be underestimated. These cannons could easily overpower opposing tanks, such as the AAT. And speaking of the armored assault tank, the configuration of the Trident's cannons do bear a striking resemblance to the droid's tank, and I'd wager some inspiration was taken on Kuat's part. Is that legal? I will make it legal. If they weren't liquidated, I'm sure Bactoid might have been suing Kuat. But it doesn't end there for the UTAT, as once again it shares a feature with its quadrupedal cousin, but this time doubles it, having four anti infantry guns to guard the rear. The UTAT was more than capable of surviving a flank attack from some daring droids. Despite having six cannons, it only needed five gunners, with the single pilot manning the final turret. Its cockpit also shares a design with the ATTE, although slightly more angled. 
and all this firepower made it a more mobile and self-sufficient artillery option for the GAR. Unlike the exposed and vulnerable AV-7 cannon, though still blocked from going through shields unlike the ATAP. As the war trudged on and battles waged for months, these vehicles would be forced into frontline combat like we see on Megiddo before Master Moody meets his end. Exposed, close to the enemy, and completely undefended from the powerful tri-droids. And while it's impressive, the UTAT wasn't perfect by any means. Its repulsor skis made it easier to glide over impossible terrain, but did open up a crucial weak point. If a rocket or mine was able to get underneath this piece and do damage to the 16 skis, well... And taking a closer look at those skis, we can see that they are in two rows on the belly of the tank, totally cancelling out its weight and allowing it to glide, made up of a series of repulsors. Which, interesting side note, there's actually anti-repulsor technology in the ATTE's feet. Instead of repelling gravity, it allows it to sort of stick to any surface. These 16 repulsing skis were very useful not only on unstable bridges, but also on snow or even water. These were low power repulsor lifts though, thus explaining its quite sad max speed. This also made maneuvering the tank a tedious process. One can only imagine how miserable this thing would be to parallel park. And luckily, the skis were blaster proof, so no sneaky commando droid could take down a UTAT with measly blaster rifle fire. It is a proper tank, and you had to use explosives. Being equipped with heavy armor, bridge deploying materials for creating its own path and even bomblet generators. This tech allowed this monster to unleash a hail of ion-charged misery against all opposing clankers, instantly rendering them inert. Not bad if the seps ever get too close, and you don't even have to worry about hurting your own men. Just some high-pitched ringing in their comps. Scanning equipment was stored below the cockpit, and although this vehicle was not a designated troop carrier by design, it could haul 20 clone troopers into battle along with a whopping 26 tons of cargo, which could include Jabba and 16 of his closest family members. So that's it for the breakdown, hopefully we can help this thing be a little less obscure. Let's look at some cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. The UTAT made its debut in Revenge of the Sith back in 2005 during the infamous Order 66 scene. Aside from that lone appearance, it was only seen as scrap in some versions of the Force Unleashed, not even every version, and is mentioned in the Tarkin novel. It is apparently seen in cutscenes from 2005's Battlefront 2, but I couldn't find it. Let me know if you guys did. Almost all of the information on the UTAT comes from an old StarWars.com feature, What's the Story? In this feature, Billy Bueller and the Dark Moose supply us with the specs and name. Moose even suggests a different name, opting for the ATCS or All Terrain Combat Sled, but this never caught on. The information these two provided ended up in the Visual Dictionary and Complete Star Wars Encyclopedia, etching Billy and Moose into Star Wars history. Unlike almost everything that has ever existed in the history of Star Wars, the UTAT has no representation in the merchandise lineup the rights for all the merchandising, all the action figures, all the toys. And then when that movie exploded, the toy sales, well that's where the money really was. No Hasbro toys, no Legos, no sick t-shirts, nothing outside of its place on trading cards and of course the visual dictionary. But the mighty trident didn't even get a spot in the iconic cross-sections books. To make sure you understand this point, Star Wars has made toys on characters and vehicles not even seen on screen. I'm looking at you, Constable Zuvio, and your supposed 7 seconds of screen time. So the UTAT's omission is somewhat surprising. The UTAT never appeared in the Clone Wars, making it, along with the ATAP, as some of the few iconic Republic vehicles that don't make the jump to animation. So that closes the hollow file on the UTAT. Please hit that like button, leave a comment, share, and subscribe. That's all the best way to help me out. Check out one of these videos if you want to see more. But most important of all, remember, if you want to go sledding in the galaxy far, far away, make sure you take this war toboggan, and the Force will be with you. Always.